Good evening and welcome. My name is Loretta Lyons. I'm the programming librarian at Guilford Free Library. Our talk tonight is Recycling in Guilford with Cheryl Baldwin. We are happy to co-sponsor this program with the Guilford Conservation Commission. We welcome your questions at the end of the talk. Please use the Q&A tool. And now I will turn it over to Janet Ainsworth, Chair of the Guilford Conservation Commission. So hi, everybody. We've been wanting to do this for about a year. And here we are tonight. We're finally doing it. And I understand there's a, a lot of people signed up. So it's a topic of great interest. Um, recycling is an important part of the state's waste management plan. And our principal speaker, Cheryl Baldwin, an environmental analyst with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, has worked in this field for more than 30 years. So tonight we're going to talk about what's in and what's out of your recycling bin. And then town engineer Janice Plasiak will talk about recycling in Guilford because there are some differences from town to town. Uh, Kevin McGee, who's the environmental planner uh, for the town of Guilford and is the staff person assigned to our commission, keeps us on the straight and narrow, uh, will be overseeing the questions that are going to occur at the end. So um, I also want to thank uh, Senator Christine Cohen's staff for providing me with a list of bills that are pending right now in the General Assembly on the topic of recycling. So I will add those bills to the chat. And if you want to go see copies of the bill text, you can go to cga.ct.gov. And there's a variety of different ways to search bills and, and bring up the copies and and uh, see what they say. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Cheryl Baldwin, tonight's speaker, principal speaker. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint presentation. So thank you so much for having me here. And I commend and applaud everybody who is on um, in this meeting or in this webinar. Uh, it is a rainy night, so there's a good reason perhaps why you're not outside enjoying the day. But um, I thank you so uh, very much for taking the time out of your schedule to learn more about one of my favorite topics, recycling. So I'm just gonna jump right in and I'm gonna talk about what is recycling? So when we think about recycling, we usually think about this top picture here, right? We uh, sort and separate all of our materials in our blue bin, or perhaps Guilford has an orange bin, every town kind of has a different color, or maybe you have a blue cart and you put all your materials in that container and then it's taken away by a hauler or a collector or maybe you bring it to your transfer station. So the material is collected. And that is a very important first step of the recycling process, but it's just the initial step. Because then that material has to be sorted and processed. It is sorted and processed at a facility we call a MRF, or a Materials Recovery Facility. Material recovery facilities, they um, do some hand sorting at the beginning of the line, and then there's a series of conveyor belts and uh, the plastics are sorted from each other and the metal is sorted from the paper, et cetera. And all of those materials are then sold. But in order to sell them, they have to do something. They have to meet a specification. Now, most materials or commodities are put into something called a bale. And you can, if you can see this down, this corner uh, in the left-hand corner here, this is a bale. Usually there's three feet by three feet by three feet, or maybe four by four by four, or maybe two by three by four. It depends on the specification. And those specifications are designed and developed by the end market because they have a certain quantity that they want. They have a certain size that they want because it depends on what they're making. They're making cardboard boxes or cereal boxes, or in this case, what is, happens is this is an example of what happens to our milk jugs, that it is often made into pellets first, and then somebody else makes a bottle. So it's a two-step process. Then that bottle is made, uh, bought by a manufacturer that makes milk, and it's bottled up again. And then what happens? 
we buy it. And that is recycling. It's collected, sorted, processed, bought, made into a new product, and then that new product is bought. So when we think about recycling, a lot of people think single stream is just like, I'm gonna just throw everything in that bin. Well, you know what? We purchase things from many places. We go to different stores and different locations to buy a range of products. And likewise, we dispose of things in many different ways. We have our trash container, we have a recycling cart, brush is collected separately, textiles are collected separately, plastic film brought to local retail stores, plastic bags and plastic film, food scraps. If you have a compost bin in your backyard or maybe your town participates in a food scraps collection, that is separate, both way separate. And then of course, I, I throw in Oscar because um, we all need a little bit of Oscar the Grouch. And so it's important to think about all these different ways in which we collect materials. It used to be, um, I can't see you all, but I'm just gonna uh, assume that some of you might be old enough to remember when we had to tie up newspapers and they even had to be separate from magazines. And sometimes I was from a, a small town, you had to literally walk him into the, the guy at the transfer station. If you didn't stack them well, he, he did, he was a little, you know, he got a little upset. Well, things got more complicated, right? Then all of a sudden we had more materials and we had mixed containers and mixed paper. And I was like, wow, we have cardboard in one and a newspaper in the same one. And then all of our bottles and cans in the other. And then of course, now we have something called mixed recycling or single stream. And what you find is all those materials are pretty much the same materials. It's just that we're combining them. Now, a lot of people have questions about whether or not we should have single stream or what's the point of single stream. And I can tell you that, you know, single stream has its pros and it does have its cons. Typically, it requires less space and equipment, including collection and storage. We have one truck coming down the, the road instead of two. However, contamination, or the things that we don't want in the recycling bin, can lower the value of those commodities and make it harder to sell that product. And then of course, higher contamination was one factor about why you might've heard about this thing called the China's National Sword, which was a policy that implemented and um, it had to do with trying to decrease the amount of contamination that was allowed in exports from the United States and elsewhere. And so I'm just gonna talk really quickly about China's national sword policy, how COVID pandemic has impacted recycling markets, and also um, the good news of the rise of domestic markets. And I'm doing this because a lot of people think, why, do, why bother recycling? Aren't we just throwing it all away? Well, we're not throwing it away. It is a very large industry in um, Connecticut. And I can tell you that we recently did a recycling economic information study and we found special recycling programs in Connecticut represent, I think it was 2.5% of our gross domestic product in the state. That's a lot. And that doesn't even uh, include all the commercial activities and it doesn't include composting. Um, it was just the residents, so that, that was pretty exciting. So anyway, uh, fiber. Fiber is the largest uh, component of what we have coming into our recycling facilities from our homes. And it is the biggest issue that was um, impacted by national sword in China. However, it didn't really impact the Northeast as much as it impacted the West Coast. Because if you think geographically, the West Coast of course is closer to Asia and they do a lot more exports than we do. However, what happened of course is the West Coast started impacting our, our markets and everybody started competing. The ultimate thing is if we have cleaner materials, we're gonna be more competitive with everybody else. The good news. So I'm part of a, a regional as well as a national uh, recycling marketing group. Uh, and this one, uh, the data comes from the Northeast Recycling Council. I apologize, it is a little outdated. It doesn't include the first quarter for 2021, but it does give you some trends and some understanding, which is 
um, in 2019 and in 2020, we had uh, a lot of new uh, facilities coming on board that can process and manufacture new products out of our mixed paper and paper. Because you gotta remember na national storage started in 2017 and 2018, so it was before the pandemic that we were already having challenges with our markets. And then in 2021, we have all these other new facilities that are gonna be coming online and even more in 2022. So what this tells me is not only are we uh, having a lot more infrastructure being developed, but it means domestic markets are on the rise. And this is a great, great thing. I know a lot of people are concerned about plastics. Everybody's concerned about plastics, but plastics is actually a pretty small part of the waste stream when you talk about the recycling system. Um, and it also is very complicated because we have so many different resin types and different processes for plastic. But we have had a lot of new facilities come online in the last couple of years. And then we have a few more coming online in uh, this year and then next year. And so it's all, all good news. And um, I, I was excited because one of the new markets that's expanding is actually uh, companies that take plastic film which always excites me because I, I, I like to, to make sure that all of our film is recycled. So a question that everybody says, so are, are we even doing it right? Well, this is, this is a tough question. The answer is really yes and no, in the sense that we are doing our best, but I can tell you we can do a lot better. And a lot of people are just confused because when single stream programming came about, it was in 2012 and we didn't necessarily increase our educational opportunities for residents in general. And single stream was confusing. People really thought everything should just go in the bin, but that's not the case. The other thing that we have to think about is you don't have to understand what this busy graph is, but I put it up here because what it tells us is that the USDA looks at um, new products coming on our retail shelves and that this tells us that the trend is that 5,000 to 10,000 new products are on our retail shelves every year. 5,000 to 10,000 new products on our retail shelves. I'm just going to let that sink in. So think about all that packaging. Do you think those manufacturers are, you know, calling me up and going, Cheryl, what do you think we should use for our packaging? Do you, do you think this is a good material? No. Do you think that they're calling our materials recovery facilities and saying, hey, can your facilities separate this out or their markets for it, blah, blah, blah? No. And so, of course, we're struggling. We're struggling because there's so many different innovations and new designs and people want to be both pragmatic, but sometimes artistic and innovative, and sometimes it misses the mark. And so we have a lot of things that are made and packaged that are not acceptable. And I can't, you can't really, you know, say that, you know, the recycling facilities should accept it. Well, they didn't manufacture it and they shouldn't have the burden of it. And they're just gonna pass that cost back onto us as residents, as well as our municipalities. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard, but we need to try to just keep it simple uh, in terms of what should go in our bin. So I think everybody's probably familiar with um, the arrows and you have like a little number on the inside. These arrows with little numbers are usually on plastic containers or things that are plastic. Many of us use these as guidelines. So I'm asking you to take a breath because I may be blowing your mind, but you should stop using that as a guide. That is a uh, industrial ASTM standard resin code meaning it tells the industry, both the, uh, the uh, recycling processors as well as the end markets, what resin that particular item is. It is not an indicator if it's in or out. It's not an indicator if it's acceptable. It's not an indicator if it's recyclable. It just tells you what type of plastic resin it is. The image that is on your screen is a much better uh, is a much better image or is a much better label to help guide us with is the material acceptable in my program. So usually it's got still it's got the recycling arrows. It identifies what it is. 
And then it says what to do, empty and replace caps because they don't want loose bottle caps. And they also don't want your soda or your water or whatever it's, is in it. This labeling system is put out by How to Recycle. They work with a lot of manufacturers. It's a voluntary program. We promote it because we think it's a great program. It gives a lot of good guidance and we encourage manufacturers to use it. Again, it's a metal can. Rinse it and then insert the lid before putting in your bin. It's a great label and I encourage you to look for this label to help you as a guide. So this is my moment to pause. And if we were in person, I would ask for um, uh, some hands or some nods because uh, what you may not realize, and I would pose the question, do you know that recycling is mandatory in Connecticut? Now, I'm not originally from Connecticut, so it surprised me as well. But in fact, recycling is mandatory in Connecticut. And then I further posed the question, when do you think the law was passed for this recycling law? Was it in 1975? Was it in 1989? Or was it in 2012? And then I would ask for a show of hands. And I can tell you the answer is in 1989, Connecticut passed a law mandating that certain materials must be recycled. And that included glass bottles and jars. It included metal cans, so that would be aluminum and tin. And then it also mandated cardboard, newsprint, and I think that was it, maybe magazines. And then of course, the trick question was because in 2012, more materials were added. At that point, soda bottles and water bottles were added, as well as milk jugs. And also uh, newsprint, excuse me, magazines, uh, box board like cereal uh, boxes, and other materials with, that are not necessarily part of the residential recycling list. So this is all the materials that are actually currently mandated by law. So it doesn't mean you have to do all of these if you don't generate them. It's about if you generate them, they should be recycled. They must be recycled. And if we look at the top part, that's our blue bin. That's our residential mixed recycling program. And I know, Janet, that you said uh, Janice is going to speak afterwards because every town is different. Well, when it comes to the, the residential mixed recycling program, every town is the same. We have one universal list. What differs is sort of how towns deal with bills of transfer station. Every town has a little bit different, whether they accept motor oil or mattresses or electronics, which household hazardous waste event they're in, et cetera. And so really ultimately this is what is acceptable in our mixed recycling bin. We want containers. We want containers that are glass. We want containers that are metal and containers, food containers that are plastic. And then of course, cardboard, cereal boxes, newspaper things, and white. If you keep it to that simple, you'll do, be doing great. And then we have a lot of other recyclables, but they don't go in the bin. Again, we have multiple places in which all these materials go. Electronics, paint, mattresses. Janice is gonna talk more about um, the program that you have specifically in Guilford and where you might put some of these items and what's acceptable in Guilford. But the thing is you have a lot of materials that are recyclable, but not everything is acceptable in the mixed recycling single stream program. We talk a lot about recycling, but we also need to sort of think a little bit more about waste reduction and reuse or preventing waste from it being generated and trying to think, um, are there things that we can reduce, reuse before recycling? Sometimes uh, it's important to think about things before we even buy them. Meaning, do you need it or do you want it? Take a moment before you hit um, the buy button. All of us are buying a lot of things online and I can tell you sometimes we buy too much because it's just so easy. So we have to think about, is it something that we really want? Can we buy it locally? Can we buy it used? Can you repair the one you already have? 
Could you borrow it from a neighbor or a friend instead? And of course, does your library offer it? Libraries are so much more than books. We need to think of libraries as an incredible community resource. I'm in New Haven and um, they offer cake pans. So um, I know there's tool lending libraries and you know libraries do so much more. So I encourage you to think about your library. Uh, in terms of food, so much we could do with food in terms of preventing waste to begin with. And I know you've probably heard this, that you make a shopping list before you go shopping. Maybe you create a menu for the week, freeze items before they go bad, rotate food in your, your refrigerator so they don't um, spoil as quickly. And while you should mark items that go in the fridge or the freezer, the photograph I have here is a little over the top. That is definitely, uh, I, don't, I don't do that. I might label for the freezer, but um, it's, all, it's all good. It's basically trying to make sure that we are reducing the amount of food that we waste. And um, I always say uh, you should eat everything on your plate and if you can't, then um, start using smaller plates. And then of course, we can really promote the concept of reuse. Um, you know, donate uh, items that have value still and have use still in them. Um, so I do encourage you to donate responsibly. Make sure the charity or nonprofit or organization is really looking for that particular material before you donate it. Think about repairing the items you have organize community events like community tag sales or swap events or free days. Again, I mentioned I'm in New Haven. It's not my neighborhood, but I know there's a neighborhood where it's like a two block area where they have a free day. They don't, it's not even a tag sale. They choose the day and everybody just puts free stuff on in their front yard. And then everybody walks around and chit chats and then takes whatever's on the lawn. And I find it fascinating. Maybe you could uh, coordinate a repair clinic and help people learn how to repair their items. Or the picture here is a mini library. Um, and then I mentioned other things that libraries can offer. So I mentioned that there's one universal list. Uh, uh, boy, it was back in 2017 now that we met with all the materials recovery facility operators and we posed these three questions. When we were trying to figure out um, how to develop a universal list, we, we weren't really quite sure where to begin, but we did know that every town had a different list. You know, um, Guilford was different from Branford, different from East Haven, who was different from Trumbull, who was different from, you know, the next town over. And in most cases, every, all the towns went to the same facility. And so it was almost like a game of phone where there was this miscommunication somewhere along the way. We can usually think of it in terms of pizza boxes as a great example, where people were like, yeah, I can't do pizza boxes, or I can do any pizza boxes as long as there's not a lot of grease, or I can do pizza boxes, uh, but not the top, or not the bottom, or not the liner, or whatever. Well, I'm here to tell you there's one universal list that the materials recovery facilities have all approved, and we review this list from time to time. The questions posed to them is, is this material when it comes into your facility harmful or unsafe for your employees? Is the material coming through harmful to your equipment? Or is this material uh, potentially reducing the value of other commodities? And from that, we created the list. I'm sorry, my cat wants to leave. So um, these are the top five contaminants that we have. And this list comes from a statewide waste characterization we did back in 2015, which is why we decided to come up with the harmonized list because they were so problematic. Again, in 2015, when we did the study, we found that 14 to 19% of the materials coming into our recycling facility was contamination. And when I say it is contamination, it means things that the facilities don't want and things that the facilities end up putting in the trash. And so these are things that cost all of our towns money. The more they have to sort, and the more they have to clean our stuff, the more expensive it is gonna be for all of us. And these are the top five contaminants that were discovered in our waste characterization study. Plastic bags are a big one. Shredded paper, 
I was surprised by shredded paper because we all know it is recyclable, but it is no longer acceptable because what happens is um, whether it's in a paper bag, a plastic bag or loose, the whole thing just kind of explodes and little bits of paper get in everything. And then what happens is when you go to the facilities, the air is so thick with confetti, it actually causes um, air quality concerns for the workers. And so um, it, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, the facilities often said, oh, yeah, we could take it. But when you really pressed upon them about, is this detrimental to your system? Is it detrimental to your staff? Is it really something you want? These are things that they don't want. And if they're telling you otherwise, it's because they want your contract. And that's not a good thing to be in because when we start contaminating, it impacts the entire state. It impacts all of us. So they also don't want bagged materials because they can't tell the difference between recyclables and waste. They don't want things that we call tanglers. So that includes everything from garden hosers to hangers to clothing and of course, plastic bags. And that's because they tangle up in the machinery. And they also don't want loose bottle caps, which is why we talk about keeping caps on the bottle. And if the caps are not on the bottle, you should put them in the trash. So no loose bottle caps. So can you tell the difference? Can't see your hands, but can you tell the difference between which is the trash and which is the recyclables? And of course you can't because it's the same exact photograph. And that's the point. When it, our materials are coming in on the line and they go up on a conveyor belt, staff folks are pulling apart things. They can't, they don't have time to pick through the bag. They can't tell that you have beautiful, clean recyclables versus you know, a bunch of diapers. They really can't tell the difference. And so what's gonna happen? It's all gonna go in the trash, including the recyclables that you spent time cleaning and sorting. So don't bag your materials. Keep your materials loose. Oh, in case you misunderstood what I said, don't bag your recyclables, thank you. And this is why. So this is machinery at a MRF in Connecticut. And all of this stuff is plastic wrap and cords. And oh, do you see that? Do you see that yellow image? That is a man. That is a man that probably lives down our street or is a family uh, or a, a friend. And they had to jump into that machinery cut all this stuff off. And that's what you find in the facilities. Every morning, they have a 15 minute break, they have lunch, and then they have an afternoon break. And while most people are taking a break, two guys have to um, stay back and manually cut everything off of the screen. It, and just so you know, the rollers here are covering sharp, sharp knifey edges. Because what they do is there are these like knife-like edges that move like this. And what they do is the con it's a conveyor belt that moves containers and things up, but it can't do that when they're covered in plastic. And so they have to literally cut everything off. So he's cutting things off of these knife, sh you know, these sharp things. So we really need to keep bags and tanglers out. And this is all the stuff he cut while I was just standing there taking his picture. Now, that was the first 15 minute break. That's a lot. Every facility, every day. I don't know who's in, in, the, in the scheme of business, but this is not a good way of doing business if you have to shut down your line three times a day. That's costly. And who do you think is paying for it? We are. And so the better we can do, the better we're gonna save money. <coughs> Excuse me. So what should happen to our plastic film? Of course, we need to bring it back to retailers. There are a lot of participating retailers and grocery stores that will take our plastic bags as well as our other film. And uh, in response to uh, creating that universal list, we also have a new webpage called the RecycleCT.com. This is put out by the RecycleCT Foundation. 
some changes, some initial changes is all pizza boxes are in. It doesn't matter how much grease, we just don't want crust, no anchovies, no food, and uh, no liner. And when the program first started, we did allow black plastic containers, and that was a change that was made two years ago, back in 2019, um, that the facility operators felt that they could not really handle the quantity of plastic, black plastic coming in. And the reason being is the optic scanners that are in the, in the um, facilities can't pick up black. And so it can't understand what it is, and so it ends up contaminating paper. And of course, no loose bottle caps, no shredded paper, no plastic bags, and no styrofoam of any kind. It doesn't matter if it's a cup, a tray, a block, pellets, peanuts, no styrofoam. And some things are just trash. It reminds us that we need to think about um, buying things differently or using things differently if we are trying to produce less trash. So why does quality matter? Well, let's go back to why recycling is important. We're at the front line. We're at the front line of pulling all those materials together. And when we can reduce the amount of contamination going in, it's easier for the facilities to process. It's easier for them to meet that sales specification. They're gonna more likely sell that material. The end market's gonna be happier because they're gonna to have to do less cleaning and sorting of the material when it comes in. They're gonna be able to make a new product, sell that product, use that product, and then we're gonna be able to buy it. And so this is a picture of glass. This is a picture of glass at a MRF. This is all the stuff that they don't want. It's not a container. It's not a piece of cardboard. It's not a cereal box. It's stuff that you wish could happen, but it is not acceptable. <clears throat> A lot of other items that are unsafe, that should definitely not go in the recycling bin, are batteries, syringes, propane tanks, ammunition, believe it or not, they find ammunition. And they do find propane tanks that causes explosions a lot. It's an unsafe material. It is gonna explode. And for some reason in the summer, they always seem to get lots of lawnmower blades. I know it's metal, but you know what? Janice is going to talk to you about maybe what your scrap metal options are. Same with knives and other utensils. They're unsafe. They come in on the line and the guys have to sort, and knives are not safe. And then, of course, diapers and tampons are just gross. So this is the RecycleCT.com webpage. And on the webpage is a search tool. And you can put in the item that you are asking about. Not only is the search tool on the RecycleCT.com webpage, but any municipality, waste hauler, recycling facility, nonprofit organization, or um, uh, faith-based organization, anybody can put this widget on, or their search tool on their webpage if they want to. Um, Janice, is this on your, you, your webpage in the town? No, but I, I just made a note that it needs to be the, a link added. <laughs> oh, nice. Sorry. I was going to promote it. I thought it was already there. I didn't mean to. That's well, okay. Now you've got a, a nice little to-do list. Excellent. <laughs> I well, think we, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, we reference what's in, what's out, but I don't know if the actual link to uh, kinetic, uh, Recycle CT is there. So. Great. Well, it is yours. It's also open to the Conservation Commission or anybody else that might mm -hmm. want to promote it. And then I can also give you a secret because it hasn't been announced yet, but RecycleCT is purchasing an app. And so we will be unveiling an app probably uh, in about a month, which I'm very excited about. And we're also adding um, questions and answers specifically around organic. So if you're learning how to compost, we'll soon have some questions about composting in there. So if you are, still confused 
I would say the big thing to know is always check the list of what is in and versus what is out and recognize that there's a difference between what is acceptable versus what is recyclable. Because a lot of things may be quote unquote recyclable, but that doesn't mean they're acceptable in this particular program. The same with plastic film. There's a lot of things that are acceptable in the plastic film program, but there's also things that are not acceptable. And I'm sure Janice gonna talk about different programs at the town transfer station and in the town, and it's the same thing. We just have to think about what is acceptable for that program. And now I'm gonna do a, a short quiz and we'll, we'll see how we go. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that I'm a little bit larger and hopefully you can see me. Um, I can't see you, but I'm just gonna assume that you're participating and that you're thinking about whether or not that goes in or out. So I'm gonna pause long enough, assuming that you're thinking about the answer. All right, so I'm gonna start with an easy one. This is the styrofoam takeout container. Is this in or is this out? Oh, I, I, had, I see from the panelists out. Kevin, this is also out, excellent. All right, pizza box. In. And you were probably going to say how much grease is in it, but you don't need to know how much grease is in it. We just want to make sure there's no liner and that I've eaten all my crust. All right, this is a plastic container, in or out. This is in. And you might say what number is on the bottom, but remember, I don't care what number is on the bottom. It is container. It is a plastic container. And you know it's a container because it has a neck and a lid. All right, cracker box. This is in. And if there was a plastic liner on the inside or a plastic bag, you would take the bag out and the bag would go in the trash and your box would be in. Milk carton, in or out. Oh, there's hesitation. This is in. <laughs> Connecticut accepts milk cartons. And you'll notice my, my cap is still on it. If again, if I had a loose cap, I would throw away the cap. But in this case, I put it back on and it's tightly on. And so it, it is acceptable. All right. Toothbrush. Oh, everybody's saying out, but... Um, it's plastic, it's so it's in. Oh, okay. I can't stump the I can't stump the uh, the expert here. You are correct. This is out because it's not a container. It doesn't matter if it's plastic. We have a little sock, but it's ripped. Is this in or out? It's out. Could we do something else with it? We could make it into a puppet. Look at Steve, we've got eyes already. Or maybe, does Guilford have a textile recycling program? We're, we're getting maybe there. Maybe we'll learn more about that. Ooh, we're gonna learn more about that soon. But you can donate this, of course, to a charity that accepts textiles for recycling. But we've got a different kind of a milk jug. Is this in or out? That's in. And again, the bottle, the cap is on it. All right, now I'm gonna get tricky. I've got two hard questions to end with. Cups, in or out? It's a styrofoam cup, out. Plastic cup, in or out? So this is a trick. So this cup is plastic and it's clear and it's acceptable. It's probably the only cup kind of cup is. But of course, the straw should be removed. And this looks just like a plastic cup, but it's not. It's a compostable cup. And this is why we often tell businesses not to purchase these cups if they're not part of a, pro a program that's going to compost it, because it can confuse people. And so you'll have to decide whether or not you can tell the difference. If you can't tell the difference, it's best to throw it all away in the trash. 
better not to contaminate the recycling than it is to guess if you're right or wrong. And then other questions. Okay, so this is a hard one too. Got all my little samples here. All right, it's a spice bottle and it's plastic in and out. Well, Jenna says in, Kevin says in, oh, everybody says in. And what about this glass, glass vitamin bowl? It's glass. Oh, Jenna, no, Dan yeah, tricking is. you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And I'll I'll add I'll add even more confusion. Um a, a little uh what do they call these again? Nip bottle. Yeah, yeah, nip bottles. So this is this is that weird thing because people also ask, what about prescription, right? Is this in or out? So prescription bottles are out. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't have to do with the fact that it's plastic. It has to do with the size. So what I'm about to tell you about all these little containers is again, if it's too confusing and you don't care, throw it all in the trash. I'm just gonna tell you now, throw it all in the trash. But if you were an Uber recycler, which I assume most of you are, or you would not be spending your Wednesday night on a webinar talking about recycling, I will tell you a clue. So material recovery facilities have screens and when it goes through all the conveyor belts, et cetera, the last part, everything goes through these screens and then lands up in the glass. Remember the glass? Remember the chapstick and the batteries and tampon applicators and everything else in the glass? That's because everything ends up in the glass. Everything that can go through a screen that is two by two inches, Anything that can go through that is gonna contaminate the glass. So this is where it gets tricky, right? Prescription bottles, they can pop through and contaminate. Spice bottle, nip bottle. This is why nip bottles are an issue for some bottle bill people because nip bottles are not acceptable in the program. Why? Because they're gonna contaminate the glass. But then we have a vitamin bottle. Some vitamin bottles are so big, it won't fit through. So this would be okay. And then of course we have a glass bottle, which is also okay because what happens to all the stuff, it ends up in the glass. So that explains why we don't accept prescription bottles in other small containers. And again, bit too much information to remember, just throw all small containers out because it's better not contaminate the recycling um, in general. And so um, I'm gonna leave it there so that uh, we can talk more about any questions that you have. And I'm gonna hand it over to Janice. That's probably gonna share so much information about Guilford. I can't, I can't wait to take notes. So well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'm sometimes a wishful recycler, so I have to <laughs> practice on that. Um, but to, to give some more information about um, the program at the transfer station, um, we do offer, offer a number of free recycling um, beyond the, the single stream, what's in, what's out program through the state. We also have the free um, recycling of mattresses and box springs. Um, we have um, free recycling of any kind of um, scrap metal or metal pieces or anything like that. Um, and we also have an electronics recycling program that's also free. And uh, we do have on our website the types of things that are accepted through the um, electronics recycling. It's quite a long list of um, different things, but basically if it has a cord on it and you can plug it in, um, it, it's recyclable through this electronics program. Um, we also take in um, uh, light bulbs at that um, electronics recycling as well. Um, we also offer at the, at the transfer station um, recycling of tires. That's a pay program uh, of various sizes. Uh, we go from $3 up to $15 typically with uh, different size tires, but your regular car tire is $5 each. And we also um, accept appliances for recycling and we do charge $10 per appliance. 
Some of that is associated with the costs is, um, for Freon removal and such. So you do have the opportunity to bring a lot of items to the transfer station in, in addition to the single, single stream, which um, Cheryl just went through. We also have um, clothing bins at the, the transfer station for like Salvation Army, Goodwill, various different um, programs, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Uh, and um, we have a book bin as well. I encourage you to take any good books to the Guilford Free Library uh, for their book sale. But if there's something that they won't accept, then certainly um, you can take it to the, we have two book bins up at the transfer station that you can bring um, and any books that um, you, know, you, you don't wanna throw in the trash. Um, we do have in town the option to um, do a pay service for food scraps. Um, that's through Blue Earth. We had a, a group of citizens in Guilford and Brantford um, working with our um, with a pro group of people who got a program running with Blue Earth. And so it is a pay as you go um, program. Um, but it is available to a certain area of uh, Guilford and Brantford. Um, so if you're interested, you could always reach out to me. I am looking into trying to develop a food scrap program at the transfer station, but there's some um, challenging limitations on how long you can let food scraps sit around for. So we'll be looking into that further, but right now it's not available at our transfer station. We do participate with Has Waste, and I encourage um, people to take advantage of the Has Waste Central uh, for um, uh, getting rid of all of those hazardous materials that we may have in the house. Um, we just did run a, our first ever satellite Has Waste here in town. It was very um, well received and uh, well attended, so that was that was exciting. Um, and I encourage you also to utilize the uh, brush and leaf facility that we have uh, separate from the transfer station on Sullivan Drive, except brush and uh, leaves for, um, uh, we turned it into mulch and things. Um, so that's pretty much um, kind of what we have. Uh, we are looking to add potentially another bin to the transfer station for those items, more like a textile recycling program where, um, you know, they're not good for the, the uh, charity organizations, uh, but, we, but you want to, you know, still be able to uh, keep it out of the trash. So we are looking um, at expanding that. And I want to point out that, you know, there's a number of groups in town that have been very helpful and, and, and spearhead some of these programs. Um, we have our um, sustainable um, Guilford group, um, who's helpful with uh, this, this new program with the um, the textile recycling, as well as um, composting and, and things like that. Uh, and when we have you know, the Conservation Commission tonight hosting this program, which I really appreciate. And then um, we do have a newly formed um, transfer station advisory committee who's gonna be working with me to help uh, get some more education and word out and make some, you know, maybe some program changes and different decisions. Um, so I just wanna, Say, if you have any questions, you can always check our website um, and we will be updating it uh, a little further. Uh, that's part of our education outreach program. And I guess, I think Kevin, you're gonna take some questions and then we can see what we can answer. Yeah, we have some questions and come into the question and answer and a couple went into the chat. Um, I'll start with the question and answer box here first. Um, so we have the question, um, First one coming in, given the fuel used for getting stuff to the recycling plant and given the energy required in actual processing of recyclables, is recycling really effective in reducing the state's carbon footprint? Uh, was it when it was shipped, uh, was it when it was shipped to China? Um, so Cheryl, do you want to take that one? Yeah. yeah. So I would say yes. And just so you know, our materials were not necessarily going to China. I'm talking just about the national sword policy that came from China and that impacted the country. So it didn't really impact Connecticut that much. So we do have exports going out to different countries around the world, but you have to remember that we are trying to reduce the amount of materials that we are extracting from the earth. And those materials are also extracted around the globe. Like if we think about where a lot of our raw materials are um, mined and extracted. They're from usually elsewhere in the in the world, and then 
they're brought here in manufacturing materials. And so by yes, by all means, having our materials recovered and recycled for making, making new products is definitely less intensive energy-wise and reduces in, and reduces the impact of climate change. Yes. Okay, the next question here. Um, since the plants don't like the shredded paper, um, what can you do with it? So I'm going to pose a question and then see if it has any thoughts. So I know that some uh, municipalities will have special events. They'll have shredding events mm -hmm. where um, you can not only bring pre-shredded paper if you only if you have your only your own shredder at home, but they will also shred paper for folks that have um, you know things that are uh, that just need to be shredded before it's recycled. Have you had one before, Janice, in your town, yeah. or have you thought about it? Uh, we have our Rotary Club does typically um, host at least one or two shredding events uh, in town where you, it's a pay program, usually as a fundraiser for them. And I, I think I recently saw another one, I don't know if it was at, at St. George Church or not. So yeah, we, we, we do see them usually used as a fundraising program, but it's a good opportunity to get rid of materials. Uh, Kevin, there's also a comment in the chat that says you can compost shredded paper from Susan Ireland. So. Um, I would be careful about what type of paper you're talking about. I know for my home composting system, I would not put in magazines. I would not put in um, circulars that have dyes. And I probably would not put in white paper. I might put some unbleached um, paper towels and maybe occasionally newsprint. But I think most people don't shred that material. That material, of course, is recyclable in the program. And so if you're talking about high grade white paper that maybe has confidential information, I, I, I would encourage uh, to put that kind of paper in your compost. And we just had a um, note come into the chat that the um, St. George's Men's Group is planning a um, event this fall with shredding. So there's a bunch of them out there. That's great. Um, now we have a person that lives in an apartment complex and nothing is separated. Um, how does that work? And does that mean nothing gets recycled? So I guess everything goes into the single trash pan, pail at the house, at the apartment complex, I guess, or dumpster. Do you want me to take that or you want to take it, Janice? Well, you can take it. <laughs> okay. So, um, so first we have to think about the law. The law actually states everyone must recycle. And it's an interesting thing that it says everyone must. So it's not that every business, every household, every church, every, you know, that's not how it's written. It says everyone must. And so because of that, um, every uh, apartment complex, condominium complex, business, et cetera, must create and have a program to collect those materials separately. So if you're in an apartment complex, it's a couple of things. One, you are responsible to participate, but of course you need somebody to create a program, especially if you're in a larger building. And so your building manager is part of the law to create a program that you can actively participate in. And at the same time, haulers and collectors that offer trash service are required by law to offer a parallel collection of recyclables. So in this case, everybody's responsible for participating. So what do you do? Well, you could talk to your property manager and say, did you know that recycling is um, required by law? I'd like to participate in the recycling program. Where's the recycling bin? Or you could go to the hauler, depending on the size of you know, home that you're in, or if you're in a condominium complex. And if none of those things happen, um, I would contact the department. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I'm gonna look it up right now. But there is a hotline number to call um, and you can notify the department and make a complaint against your property manager to say, I want them to recycle. And then at the same time, municipalities, of course, can also enforce this law mm -hmm. because they have also an ordinance that is written very similarly to the state law. And so um, it's something that, uh, Janice might also be able to help with. I don't know your role and responsibility in your job, but municipalities can play that role as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question down is, um, 
mold the problem in closed containers. So I guess you rinse it out, you put the cap on it, and it gets thrown in there, and mold gets create potentially gets created. I I can't imagine a lot of mold unless you're hanging on to containers for six months. Um, but if you're participating in the program on a weekly basis, that shouldn't be an issue. Okay, next one um, sort of touched on, but maybe reemphasize here. Um, what is the status of plastic containers which were filled with things like car oil, transmission fluid, new and used, et cetera, or other household items such as laundry detergents? So um, usually uh, all food containers are in and things that had hazardous or toxic materials should go in the trash. And so your laundry detergent and dishwashing soap and even shampoo, those are all acceptable in the program. The things that have um, sort of bleach and other chemical cleaning supplies or oil, should those empty containers should go in the trash. And of course, if they're full, you should talk to Janice about participating in, in your hazardous waste collection event. Um, so note here is the, um, I guess at the end of the cycling pro uh, the um, process there, um, do they use the caps or just throw them out um, when it gets to those mixed recycling plants there? I'm sorry, that was loose bottle caps? Yeah, loose bottle caps. Yeah, loose bottle caps will contaminate the glass. And so if they're successful at sorting it out of the glass, it'll go in the trash. Okay. And then similar follow up here is um, metal lids attached to glass jars. Or is that an um, appropriate thing to do? Yeah, because it's a metal container. I know I did this whole thing on lids, caps, and uh, there's, there's a lot of difference between lids and bottle caps. Um, but lids are acceptable, whether they're metal or plastic. And lids tend to be larger. And so if you had a yogurt container, that's a lid. And if you have a pickle jar, that's a lid. But a bottle cap is with a small neck. Um, and bottle caps, again, are loose. The other thing to know, beer bottle caps are out as well. I was kind of surprised about that, but they are. Uh... Uh, another question here, do you think it's better that we have to keep materials here, um, that we have to deal with pollution rather than shipping it somewhere else? I mean here is in Connecticut or domestically or internationally? I don't think okay. we can control the global marketplace. You know, it's like, Every facility has their own market. So some facilities may be sending their materials to Pennsylvania. They may be sending it to New Jersey. Uh, there's a lot of plastic industry in Georgia. I don't know if that's too far for you. And of course, um, what I found interesting is that some of our, um, some facilities have had issues with paper um, and they've had to stockpile because of the, um, of the barge that was stuck in the channel. And um, yeah, that kind of surprised me. And that's because they had materials going to India. And so I think it depends on where the market is and what the prices are. You know, think about whether or not you go to Target versus Walmart versus, you know, Stop and Shop versus Price Chopper. Everybody has their own way of trying to figure out the products that they want and how, what the cost is. Very similar for materials recovery facilities selling their materials. They have different products, different materials, bid specifications, et cetera. I don't know if that answered the question. Okay. Um, and then we have a viewer here um, concerned of the, um, or questioning regarding, um, came in late here, but we don't think we discussed this at the beginning of our program is, will we be re posting this recorded um, message or the program for later viewing? So Loretta, do you have, do you repost that or something we can put on our page? Yes, eventually uh, we do a little bit of editing, but we usually post it in about a week on the Guilford website, uh, the library website. Okay, great. So plastic mailing bags um, and from and bags from grocery stores. Um, 
I believe those said those don't go into a single stream, but that's something that can go back to the grocery store, if that's correct, to participate. Yep. So here's a great example of a plastic mailer. It's bubble wrap on the inside and it's plastic on the outside. This is considered wrap or plastic film. It's acceptable with the plastic bag program. And then this is an example of a paper one with bubble wrap on the inside, but it's paper on the outside. This should go in the trash unless you can reuse it because reuse, of course, is really what you want to do. And um, question here, and I think we discussed at the beginning of the program here, is uh, where will new recycling facilities be located? Uh, will environmental justice concerns be taken into consideration? I don't know of any new recycling processing facilities that are being developed. Okay. And of um, course, our EJ law requires any type of a waste facility that is in an EJ community to participate in EJ program. And this one's for Janice. Um, where can we recycle our batteries? Uh, batteries can go to the regular batteries can go to the transfer station through the electronics program. Um, but large, large batteries and regular batteries can also go to the has waste and uh, car batteries can also oftentimes be brought back to the, um, you know, car, car repair, um, car parts sales places. Um, question here regarding the liner or cereal box, which is paper, is that recyclable? Okay, so cereal boxes have liners, and if the liner is paper, it is out. If the liner is plastic, it may or may not be acceptable in the plastic film recycling program. So plastic film, this is an example, it's the um, uh, bubbles, that you might get in packaging. This type of film, I'm gonna pop it, um, is stretchy. And so it stretches. This is film. So if you have cereal um, bag, a cereal box liner that is stretchy, it's part of the film program. If it crinkles and it rips, like if you might have for lettuce or bags that you might have for grapes, those are not film they rip. And if they crinkle and rip, they do not go in the plastic film program. And kind of following up with the next question here is um, plastic bags that come from um, um, your um, dry cleaners. Those are in, those are acceptable. There's a great program called uh, a great website called plasticfilmrecycling.org. And they have all the different kinds. Sorry, I'm looking for my postcard. I usually have a bunch of postcards around. Um, and they have um, all the different pictures of the things that are acceptable in the program. And so this, they will show you all the different things that includes dry cleaning bags, those uh, envelopes I was talking about, and then how to deal with cereal box bags, um, and things of that nature. And before you ask the question, wood pellet bags can be acceptable, but they ask you to open them inside out and shake them to get all the wood dust out before you put them in. And any plastic film recycling program, we'd love to have a little bit of your material at a time. And if you've been saving it for six months or 12 months, don't give it to them all at once. They're not gonna, they're not gonna appreciate it. So I hurry you to do it on an ongoing basis every time you go to the store. And more for your in and out list here, um, potato chip bags. Out. And, then, and then another one in or out, um, coffee bags that foil can be recycled with foil. Nope, those are out too. Coffee bags are out. Frozen vegetable cardboard boxes. Those are in, but the liners are out. So anything on the inside, whether it be like the plastic frame or the plastic bag is all out, but the box is acceptable. That's a good one. I'll have to, I'll have to pull one of those as a sample for my next one. So thank you to whoever asked that question. 
Um, and then um, can Ziploc type bags go to the grocery stores with those plastic bags? They can, no, they have dry. Uh, and then another question here. So if a haulers are not complicit in separating materials, what can be done? I would call the department and uh, file a complaint. Complaints can be anonymous. And I had uh, posted the toll-free number, compliance assistance number. I'll do it again. Um, that's the number you would contact to um, notify the department that um, perhaps somebody is not complying with the recycling law. Okay. Um, no, I got a note here from a person saying that um, Big Y no longer accepts the plastic bags. Um, is there any place in Guilford that takes them? Um, Janice, do you know anything? No, Big Y was my only option. <laughs> so I wasn't aware they weren't doing it any longer. I'm not sure if Walmart does or not, um, but I, I would, you would have to check. Okay. So um, I can tell you a couple of things, and this is for you too, Janice. So COVID really messed up the plastic film recycling program in that um, first off, it's to know that it's voluntary for the participating retailer. The retailer is doing it um, because they are doing it a service to us as their customer. And uh, the markets are really good right now for plastic film. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with a couple of different companies and so I'm hoping to give the program a refresh, if you will. And part of it is to reach out to retailers such as Big Y. Um, what's interesting is it's probably not all the Big Ys. It might just be your store. Because I hear this from other folks too, that they're like, my stop and shop or my you know, price shop or my whatever. And it's sort of a store by store basis because managers may have chosen to stop it during when the pandemic first started. Some started up again, some didn't. Um, and we've heard reports that some are collecting it and then tossing it because they don't want you to know. And so we're going to um, start a program this summer, reaching out to retailers and helping um, them with a toolkit and how to make sure that they find the market and that they're preparing those materials. So that doesn't help the person that just asked that question, but I just wanted you to, to know that we are aware of it and um, it is on a case by case basis. And I put a web page in there so you can find out who's participating in the program. So you can try to find another store. Okay, I think we just had a couple of pop up in the chat where you're talking, uh, indicating that Brantford Stop and Shop um, may still be doing it. And there's a potential um, to check in the recycling room at Big Y in Guilford. Um, they may have moved it out of their store, but it may be in the recycling um, bottle area there. Uh, let's see a note here. Um, uh, an issue with newspaper bags is they get 17 papers a week. I tried recycling them at Walmart and stuff, nothing in their program. This bag went to the transfer station. Maybe newspaper companies should collect the bags. So these are the Plastic bags, I take it, Joe, for the um, that your newspapers come in. Um, yeah, that's acceptable in the program, but as we were saying, you're going to have to find a participating store. Um, too bad you can't find the reuse box for that for um, dog walkers. That might be a great thing. Oh, yeah. Well, do you have any trails that have a little box at the beginning for, you know, bags? Mm -hmm. save them and then put them at the beginning of the trail. I bet the other walkers would appreciate that. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, are the plastic shells that come with toys or tools recyclable? So the, I guess the outside plastic. packaging of stuff. Yeah. I'm going to say no because it's not a container. And I'll just show you, because I happen to have it right in front of me. This is a container that had batteries. It doesn't matter if it's plastic. It's actually not a food container. It wasn't, it's, it's not acceptable. So maybe it's the same type of material that you, you're, uh, you're risen and asked. Now, somebody has a note about K-Cups. I know you did a discussion there earlier. So um, 
cups. So K cups, as long as they're plastic, are recyclable. Or it doesn't no. matter if they're recyclable; they're not acceptable in this program. Okay. So K cups, coffee pods, whatever they are, are not acceptable in this program. That there's the two inch rule on that one. I'm sorry. Say that again. Two inch screen rule on that one. Probably. Uh, actually, it's more that it's a mixed material that's just not acceptable. Um, tissue boxes. Kind of like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tissue boxes are in. Uh -huh. Even if they have that little plastic around the edge, that's, that's okay. Okay, the question was, do you have to remove the plastic so that can stay on there? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with, I think somebody said, what about windows with little plastic window inside? And if you have like a business uh, letter that arrived and it has that little plastic window, the plastic window is fine. Okay. Um, so, um, question about lettuce containers. Oh, like the tubs? Those are in. Okay. Uh, and how well does things need You're to be rinsed? Through a lot of questions. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm almost there, I think. Um, um, so how well um, does things again just rinse just rinse you don't have to scrub them a little bit different i think for cat uh food containers or tuna and peanut butter but most things just need to be rinsed i know i rinse mine in the dishwash soap that i already have in the sink from dishes and that's plenty fine um and I, somebody asked why only i guess food containers for plastic recycling Because those are the type of containers that are mandatory. It's the type of containers that um, have markets for um, processors to make new products out of. It's probably not a great answer, but there it is. <laughs> and it's also safe. You know, somebody asked a question about motor oil containers, and there's a reason that motor oil is not acceptable. It's explosive, you know, mm. could cause some issues, especially if there's oil still in it. And um, it's not a material that you want mixed with all the other uh, plastic materials. And then somebody has an informational note here um, indicating that um, Van Wilgens in North Brantford has a dumpster to take back their plastic planting containers. So there's a opportunity there. Um, but you said in your program there that you don't you don't take black plastic as you indicated for food containers. Is that correct? Uh, this yeah, this program does not. But yeah, I know that a lot of landscapers and uh, plants just will take back pots, which is fantastic. And I think I hit the highlights here. Um, see if there's anything in the chat that we might have missed. Kevin, someone had submitted a question to the library regarding uh, takeout food containers, whether they're in or out, and whether you have to dismantle the metal or how that works. All right. Takeout containers 101. If you have a, an aluminum foil bottom, it's in after you've rinsed it. If that had a paper top with foil on the inside, that is out papers out. If it had a plastic top and you rinsed it, that's in. Chinese takeout, that's paper with a metal handle. The whole thing is out. Why? Because it's paper and the metal is a, a tangler. The whole thing is out. Um, if you have, uh, we did a, did a quiz about styrofoam. If you have a styrofoam container, clamshell, whatever it is, it's out. Um, what other types of takeout? You might get your takeout in a paper bag. The paper bag is in. If you have a paper bag with wire uh, cord handles, the cord handles are actually a tangler. So you could throw the whole thing out or you could rip off the handle. Um, receipts are fine on top of bags if they staple the receipt on it. Um, am I missing some type of takeout container? Lately, oh, there's a lot of new paper ones. 
there are a lot of brown ones, you know, brown paper ones that they kind of fold. And those are just like the Chinese takeout, they're out because oh. they're paper. There's no paper takeout acceptable. Um, if you have the black plastic bottom with the plastic on the top, because black plastic's not acceptable, the bottom is out, but the top is in. Now you have a lot of the, the biodegradable um, materials now. Are those in or not? The fire? So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause and say, what do you think? What do you think the answer is to that? Trash. So we're we're accepting glass, plastic, and metal containers, and then fibers like paper, cardboard, etc. So if you have a biodegradable product, it does not belong in this program. It may belong in composting, but it may not be because not all composting programs take and accept all things. So you're going to have to think about the difference between um, recyclable, compostable, and acceptable. So um, biodegradable things are not acceptable in this program. Okay, I think I hit everything. If somebody sees something I missed, let me know. That's amazing. That was a huge list, Kevin. Good job. <laughs> Actually, there was a question at the very beginning. You had mentioned a percentage, and I forget in what context, and somebody wanted to clarify what that number was. I think it was the, the 2.5% 2. 2. of the GDP in Connecticut is associated with the recycling oh. industry. Oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, so there, we did a recycling economic study that's on the Recycle CT um, webpage. I'm just gonna go to it. It's been a while since I've looked at it, so I may have that wrong. Let me, um, I'm gonna uh, provide a link to the study so that you can see the study, including an infographic, which is very exciting. Oh, maybe the hyperlinks didn't work. Sorry, let me try it again. Ah, technology. So this is uh, the hyperlink to the infographic. And then this next one is the uh, hyperlink to the study. And the, hyper, the, the what does the um, infographic say? Oh, 0.25%. So I had the 2.5 right, but I had my, my point in the wrong spot. That's a big difference. Good, good whoever was listening to me. Good job. And then one question here for Janice, following up on the big recycling event that we had for Haz Waste there. Um, um, a lot of paint waste that came in. Um, do you want to comment on how to uh, manage the paint waste so they don't have to hold on to it for these yearly events? Yeah, so we encourage people, um, you can return uh, paint cans that still have paint left in them uh, to the retailers now. Um, they're, they're charging, a small fee every time you buy a paint can because it's a, a new program in Connecticut that they are accepting them back. So like Pages and County, uh, Country Hardware, um, Rings End, they may have a limit on number of cans you could bring back at a time. And I think Pages is like five cans at a time. Uh, so I encourage you not to like, we had people come through the Hasways thing with like 20 cans of paint. And while we'll take it and, and take care of it, there's a program that doesn't cost money, you know, to the community if you just take it back to the retailer. So there's a lot more programs and Cheryl, you may agree that are, are, we're trying to get it back to the retailer, back to the manufacturer to take responsibility for some of these things to get them out of the waste stream. That's great. And I might, might want to add too, though, is if it's a can of paint and it's all dried up because it was mostly used or you can get it to dry up, um, then that can go just right in the trash. Very good. Uh, let me see if anything new came in, but I think we, um, 
Somebody made a comment here. Does the two in rule apply to metal cans? I don't know what that means. The two what rule? Two in rule. I don't know either. Two, two inches, maybe. Oh, maybe. Oh, probably. I can't think of any metal containers that are smaller than two inches. But it does give you a reason that maybe you shouldn't make uh, your aluminum foil into little balls. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I know a, a couple of colleagues love to put it into little balls, and I say, don't put it into balls. <laughs> Good point. It's just so much fun, apparently. <laughs> We've all been inside for too long. <laughs> Oh, tomato paste. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Unfortunately, I think it's becomes too small. I hate seeing this. So I know a lot of stuff I might yeah, think more in my trash the, pan the metal, now. Yeah, the metal doesn't apply in that situation because um, aluminum is blown off, off and uh, still is gathered by magnets. Right. Um, so it's really about um, plastic materials. So I apologize if I wasn't clear before. Okay, I see nothing really new coming in for questions here. Well, thank you, Kevin, for the, <laughs> that moderating all those rapid fire questions. Great job. Uh, I think it's a nice reflection of the interest in the, in the topic as well, so. Um, thank you to Janet and Janice and very uh, big thank you to Cheryl Baldwin um, for the for the talk and uh, the we will have this recording up probably in about a week on the Guilford Library website. Um, so thank you all. Any uh, parting comments? We all set? Um, I, I definitely want to thank Cheryl again for coming to Guilford. Uh, virtually, of course, uh, in the old days, you would have gotten to drive down here. <laughs> and I would just say, don't be hard on yourself. Just try to do a little bit better every day. <laughs> Thank you. That's good <laughs> advice on all fronts. <laughs> good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Good night.